On today's edition of the Booth Review, five and two, feeling pretty good, Big Fletch. We're a well-oiled machine. Who's the diesel fuel? And who's going to get Big Fletch's championship belt this week? It's the Booth Review. Ring the bell. Welcome into the Monday edition of the Booth Review podcast after a dominant 40 to 7 win over the Carolina Panthers with Big Fletch, London Fletcher, who I'm now noting we, we do this every week. We like to talk about your stats. <laughs> 39 and a half sacks, two less than one Ray Lewis, happens to be in the Hall of Fame. Yes. He played another uh, uh, one more season than you did, too. So, he did. He did. Yeah. You, you know what? Um, so the whole Big Fletch thing, just to kind of reintroduce Big Fletch. He's my alter ego. Uh huh. And so I like to hear about what I did. Yeah. Or Big Fletch likes to hear about what he did. And when I talk about Big it's Fletch, I'm tar- talking third person. All of the Fletchers <laughs> like hearing about what you did. Okay. Uh, I think Big Fletch liked the way the defense played yesterday, too. I'll get into the offense. And we're going to spend some time on Marcus Mariota and Jaden Daniels. And up front, spoiler as we're taping this, we don't know what Jaden's you know health situation right, is. So exactly. we're going to find out later today, just yep. like everybody else. So we'll get into all the quarterback stuff. But I actually want to start with the defense because there were two things that they had to do yesterday to win, mm-hmm. and that was slow down a running game. It's the one thing Carolina does really, really well with Chuba Hubbard, very expensive guards that have played very, very well this yes. year. And they have a real number one target in Deontay Johnson. He had one catch. Hubbard at halftime had 12 carries, 25 yards, ended up 17 for 52, something like that. Mission accomplished yesterday because they took away the two things that Carolina could do. Yeah, absolutely. And we talked about this on the air a lot. I was a little nervous about Carolina's offense and going into that ball game because of their ability to run the ball and how well Chuba Hubbard had been playing the last four ball games. He was averaging over 100 yards a game. And then you look on – you look at Deontay Johnson, and, man, he had that quickness in the release, and he was starting to uh, really get get this connection with Andy Dalton. So I was a little concerned, like, okay, they can give us a little bit of a problem. But then defensively, man, the way they played in that ball game, starting off with the Fowler interception, yeah. which I know we're going to talk about, that really set the tone for the rest of the game. And they made – Carolina, one-dimensional for the most part, they really shut down that run game. And they played outstanding football in a, in a game where you're missing Jonathan Allen. You're missing Dorrance Armstrong. So you're down two of your premier defensive players. In the, John that Baptiste front seven. is part of the rotation. John, He's out yeah, too. John Baptiste yeah. as well. And those guys on the defensive front really set the tone. And you can tell they took it personal and took the challenge of saying, hey, we're not going to let the Carolina Panthers come in here and try to run a ball against us. Not today. Then there's Andy Dalton, who it's funny when you, when you people think whatever they think of him at this point in his career. Yeah. And then I was citing stats yesterday. I go, you know, when he throws three more touchdown passes, he's going to pass Sonny Jurgensen all time, right? When he throws for a thousand more yards, assuming he plays enough the rest of the year to throw for a thousand more yards, he's going to pass Joe Montana on schedule. He's still a very productive, very good quarterback and has this connection with Johnson. But when you get him moving around, there's a problem. And Washington knew this. They went in. The object was to bring heat on him, get him off schedule, you know, take their chances with their corners, probably in more of an island situation than they're probably accustomed to, but probably like there's matchups a little bit different than they have recently. They got him moving, and they got exactly what they wanted, which was turnovers, and they've been talking about this for weeks. In fact, Joe Witt said last week in his press conference, he goes, we've played six games, I've had one interception. That has never happened in my (laughs) career. Like, it was the challenge was put out there. That's not acceptable, and there they were, two in the first quarter. The thing about interceptions is there's kind of this saying in, def- in the defensive meeting room, they come in bunches. Once you get that first one, first one, it seems like they start to come in bunches. And last week we got the first one against the Baltimore Ravens. Yesterday we got two against the Carolina Panthers. You mentioned the pressure. The pressure from, uh, from Cleveland Farrell mm-hmm. on Andy Dalton kind of forced him to throw that Aaron pass that – that Dante Fowler was able to uh, intercept and really ignite us and, and, and get that, that stadium in a, in a buzz and just the electric atmosphere was tremendous. Defensively, we also did a great job of 
taking away the quick throws against Andy Dalton. One of the things that he did once once he took over at the quarterback spot for the Panthers, his release time, his pocket time was 2.2 seconds, which was the fastest in the NFL. So he was getting the ball out of his hands quickly. Yes. You talk about playing on time, playing on schedule. There was times where we took his initial th- read away, forced him to hold on to the football, get some pressure, make him move, inaccurate throws, through another interception to Emmanuel Forbes. So the game plan, they executed it to a T from a defensive standpoint. Yes. On Fowler in the interception, obviously kind of got the ball rolling the right way. Um, him, Farrell, you mentioned him too. I think people forget in camp, they didn't play very much in the preseason. Mm-hmm. And then both of them actually had issues that were kind of limiting them at the end of camp. And they were rotating. Farrell's missed a couple of games. Dante's really gotten up to speed, really over the last couple of weeks. You have felt his impact the last few games. And I think some of that was a little bit injury-related because it was under the radar that he was right. dealing with stuff at the beginning of the season. Well, you think about when we interviewed him yesterday in, on the uh, post-game interview, and he talked about how missing preseason and how he was kind of a rusty, felt like he wasn't playing up to his standards and – the last, the last, I know, at least two games, maybe even three games, he's he's truly turned it up a notch. And, I mean, I think he had two sacks against the, the Ravens. So you're starting to feel his impact and why Dan Quinn was so adamant about bringing him with him. Yeah. He's been with Dan Quinn everywhere. He's, you know, going all the way back to to his Atlanta days. They drafted him in, in Atlanta. He was with them in, in Dallas, and now he's brought him here. So he knows what he brings to the table, especially – being down a couple guys on that defensive front, he's his play and his performance the last few weeks have been outstanding and much needed. You know, so he came here because of this coaching staff. Yeah. Jeremy Chin told us that, too. Remember, we had him on on the postgame show yesterday, too. He's playing his ex-team. It's a big deal for him. He said he wanted to be here with this coaching staff. It's already like I think it's already out there that he turned out more money from other places to end up signing here. Carolina did want Frankie Louvu back. He chose to come to play here. Dorrance Armstrong follows Dan Quinn and Joe Witt from Dallas mm-hmm. to here. Like, there is something about that that I think has been a touch underrated throughout this entire process because I think there's a lot of disbelief that's going on about what's going on here, and I understand it because I lived it too. You played in it, where for a very long time, you know, we, uh, someone asked Dan Quinn a couple of weeks ago, some, it was one of the reporters from the Washington Times where he said, I think a lot of people are waiting for the other shoe to drop. Right. Because it has for 20 years. It has. Maybe, maybe more. And this is different. And I think we all recognize it's different. And I've turned the corner on seeing it's different. But I understand why on the outside that people are still going, wait a minute. Like, mm-hmm. this almost feels a little too unbelievable. But when you go back to how they put the roster together, the reasons why these players came here, that they're performing at this level because they wanted to be here, to be with this staff. They don't care what the past was. They weren't here for any of it. You're starting to get kind of the reasons why this is happening faster than anybody could have anticipated. I think you even go back to, obviously there's a new ownership group, and just go back to the process of, hiring Adam Peters, and then the process of hiring Dan Quinn and all the coaching staff that they put together, that process has brought us to where we are right now. It's a measured approach in free agency. They were strategic in not signing a bunch of, you know, just outlandish contracts. The draft class that they got, man, these rookies that they brought in, not just Jaden, but you're getting – Sandra still's coming Sandra, on. Sandra still getting pro. Johnny Newton's going to be profiled now. No, no Newton. Senna got his first uh, catch and first yeah. touchdown of his career. And those guys, Brandon Coleman, starting left tackle. Luke McCaffrey. Luke McCaffrey. So that's a this draft class and the players that they brought free and free agency is the reason why we're in the position that we're in right now. And then but the culture, man, the how they compete at such a high level. And that goes back to just Dan Quinn and his philosophy and yeah, people are waiting for the other shoe to drop. I don't know. That, I don't think it's going to drop. No, I don't think you know, it is either. It's, it's, like, they're going to be competitive in all the games. I'm not just saying that because we're sitting here and we're looking at this. 
I've been professionally covering this franchise for a quarter century. I've been a fan of it my entire life. Mm -hmm. I've watched every play that they've run my entire life, but I've professionally been around it. I've not been around something like this in my time covering this. They've had good teams. They've had good coaches, right? They've had good players like you and Santana and Chris Cooley and many others that have come through here. But I have not had a feeling like this, maybe for a short period of time with the Gibbs teams in the second year, once he got back up to speed, you got that same feeling about what was being built here and that they were very capable of things. This one has happened really fast, but I'll tell you what, when we were in the locker room after that Baltimore game, that's all I needed to know about where they are. They were in, as they described, their first heavyweight fight. It did mm. not go the way they wanted. Defensively, they gave up way too many yards and a bazillion big plays. They gave up seven plays of 20 yards or more. They had given up 10 combined in the four-game winning streak. It was not up to, quote-unquote, their standard. What do they do the next week? They are playing a weaker opponent. No offense to Carolina, but they are, right? A beat-up, injured opponent who's limited, doesn't have an MVP quarterback playing for them, doesn't have a Hall of Fame running back playing for them. But what did they do? They took over. Dominated them. Dominated. Dominated And this is what a special season looks like, that off a loss, this is what you get. This is exactly what you get, and and you want to see, okay, how do they respond after adversity? And I wasn't – sometimes people – you worry about teams playing up to their competition or or down to their competition. I wasn't comp- concerned about them not being ready to play because of, again, being around Dan Quinn, hearing how he talks and 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 tell the truth Monday and being honest with those guys in wins and in losses. So holding them accountable in wins and losses. They were going to be ready to play the game. The thing that you just have to appreciate is the brotherhood. And you can feel it. I mentioned this when I was – you guys did the Arizona game, and I'm watching the video where they gave Cliff Kingsbury the game ball after after that victory. And the reaction, the response that he got from the team and the players after giving him that game ball. Then you see Frankie Louville in the locker room, and he's doing his, um, you know, uh, what's it called? uh, Like the haka? Haka. Something close to it. uh, (laughs) <laughs> oh, no, look, let me see. I'm, I'm, I want to uh, – and, and you see, you know, Frankie Louvo doing his haka and how they respond to him. Or the Ric Flair dance, the Ric whatever Flair, it is. All that. <laughs> right. And you just yeah. – you feel like the atmosphere, the fight, the wanting to play for each other, the, the competitive spirit, it's going to be there in all these games. Yes. Win or lose. That's going to remain. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's interesting, too, because it's a brand-new team. There's 30-something new players, new coaching staff, new everything, really. Yep. And then to your point, like what I see often, and this is what I think is very unique about to what I've seen here, why I think this is so different. They're not looking at one person to speak for the team. They're not asking nah. for one person to be the leader. They're not, none of that. Like if it's Frankie Louvu's day, Frankie Louvu gets the game ball and gets to get everybody to do two claps and a Ric Flair. Mm-hmm. If it's... Mike Sanderson's day, he speaks. If it's Austin Eckler's day, he speaks. If it's Jaden Daniels' day, he seems to defer to everybody else. The whole room is acting like they have ownership and leadership in it. And that, I think, is something that really is standing out to me about that. You just year. made me think about it. They rotate captains. Yes. Like they're. They pick captains, different captains for every game. Dan Quinn says they cheer for certain people when they get the honor. <laughs> like Jeremy McNichols, who's an incredible example of all right. of this. No, nah, that's that right there, that that buy-in right there. Because if a lot of times when you only have, and I, I, I've been a captain, I don't know, out of my 16 years, probably 13, 12 of those years I was captain. When you only have you know, a couple guys as a captain, they tend to be the voice of the team most of the time. But when you have kind of a situation in the, in the process that they go through where there is a different collect captain for each game, it forces guys to assume a leadership role and, and be willing to speak out and know that, hey, I'm, a, I, I'm not just a, a, a you know, low-end person on this roster. I'm an important, vital piece of what we're trying to accomplish. It, it's really, I mean, it's such a weird test case because it so feels unprecedented. And I think that's why everybody keeps looking at this going, what is going on here? Yeah. That you would basically tear the organization down, build it back up immediately, and be 
in position to contend. I mean, it feels off and strange, but when you think about all these moves, and granted, a lot of them have really worked out, they were all done with purpose. Mm -hmm. They brought in all of these people for specific roles, told them what their specific roles were. Many of them, as we were talking about earlier, had previous relationships with the coaching staff, wanted to be part of it because they were buying what was being sold. It had in the past, it's carried over here. There's a chip on the shoulder of Cliff Kingsbury who wants to prove to everybody in my second go around, you're going to see what I am. There's a chip on the shoulder of Dan Quinn who wants to be a second time head coach yeah. who has talked openly about here are the things I think I did wrong the first time. And here's what I want to get right. The second time you've got Adam Peters, who's been in line for this for years, right? He has been offered jobs, I'm sure, for five, ten years running to do something like this. He finally gets his opportunity because he feels like it's the right place to do mm -hmm. it. It's really remarkable what is happening here. It's really, it's, this is the stuff movies are made of. It's wild what is happening right now. Man, I was, I was walking around a concourse yesterday, heading up to the booth, and, and I just literally, and I kid you not, not hyperbole, not, I, I just was smiling because I saw the amount of fans that were in the stadium coming to a game and yeah, it was alumni and Daryl Green's retirement church, but it was more than that. When you saw the amount of fans, the concourse was packed. And this was, I don't know, at least an hour before the game. And I'm just like, man, this is just a beautiful thing. And I I just was so appreciative that and just, you know, talking to fans and how happy and met several fans who were bringing their kids to their very first game. Yeah. 12 My year daughter olds, nine year olds, yeah. Her very first game. And it was just like, man, this is a beautiful thing. And it's all because of what they've been able to build in a yes. very short period of time. Yeah, I think it, it's been interesting. Like, I agreed with that question a few weeks ago because I thought it was pulse of the fan base to ask, when is the other shoe going to drop? Mm -hmm. Because I think that's what a lot of people were thinking. They've seen this before. Team has this good month, you know, but like, how real is this? I think there were fair questions yes. for a fan base that hasn't won a lot for a very long time. Like, I grew up in the golden era of this team. I went to RFK. I, yesterday, with Daryl Green being celebrated, was special for me. I was in attendance at the NFC Championship game where he's at the goal line knocking a ball down that sends them back to the Super Bowl. I lived that in my childhood. There's a generation of people who did not. Yeah. They have watched this team be very up and down, a lot of promises, a lot of new faces, a lot of Hall of Fame caliber people that have come in here, but the results were never there. And even when a good start happened, they were waiting for the other shoe to drop. I don't feel like that's happening. And I think what you're seeing in the stadium, what we're feeling in the area, it's undeniably real beyond just that they're good. Like there is something here that is building that is completely, literally undeniable at this point. 100% agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's talk about a couple others. Emmanuel Forbes got an interception. He did. So this is good, right? We want, and the coach have talked about this. He was a healthy scratch a week ago. Uh, mainly, and I buy the reasoning, some of it was they knew the run game they were facing. They were going to bring up extra linemen because they felt that they needed it, a rotation against the Ravens offense. But he still was the choice to not right. play last week. So Dan Quinn openly talked. He's very honest with the media. He said, I talked to him about it. I told him your opportunities are going to come. Here he was, active again. And you know what? Him getting his hands on the ball is a big deal because that's him. He's confident. He doesn't care that you think he's skinny. He doesn't care. Yeah. Think he's under like, but he knows what he did in the past, and he was drafted because he catches the ball and changes games. And I think it's a big deal that he got an interception. Yeah, not only did he get a big get a big interception, he played a lot in that ball game. They were rotating him, Sam Steele, St. Juice, and also Igbenogany. Where those were the three corners. At some point, sometimes when there was only two corners on the field. It may have been him and St. Juice. It may have been him and Sam Steele. So he played it a lot, and he was a major part of the game plan. What I lo liked about it was on the interception, his positioning beforehand. He had great vision on the quarterback and also had the feel of the receiver. Johnson, he broke on that ball before Johnson even uh, you know ran his route properly. That's where you say a young guy who's developing – who's buying in, who's bought in, hey, I know I'm not playing, but I'm still 
doing everything I need to do in practice. So when my opportunity comes, I'm prepared. You don't want to – he could have kind of moped around and not fully taken advantage of his practice reps and not not did the things he knew, needed to do to prepare. And when he got his opportunity again, he, he flunked the test, so to speak. But – when he got the interception, and I don't, you know, you had to notice this, the reaction of his teammates yes. after he got that interception, like, man, we feel what you've gone through, and just the the jubilation that it, that took yeah. place. Yeah, when I hear the complaints about him, you know, it's funny. I go, I don't think you know how much his teammates actually really like him. Go look on social media about how they interact with him. I see how supportive they are of him. He's a very young player, but he does have talent, yeah. and he has. He has a gift for something that this team values more than anything on earth, getting the ball. Because when it's thrown his way, he might catch it. Oh, yeah. There's not a lot of corners you could <laughs> say that about. So I'm hoping that this hits a light bulb for him, gets his confidence up. And that's been a recurring theme, too, just the supportiveness of the room for one another. For Jamin Davis, for the end of the who preseason. Played, he was up. He played. He was game. up. For yeah. who willingly did a position shift, right? And said, yes, make me better. I want to, you know, continue my career under this coaching staff. Like the end of the preseason, how many games did we see where everybody was cheering for Trace McSorley trucking yeah. people <laughs> at the end of a preseason game? Or the end of the Miami game where they were rooting for Jeff Driscoll to try to, you know, lead a, a drive down the field. This team's been engaged with one another from the get-go. Whatever they did to get that kind of chemistry starting being built, they bought in and it's paying off huge right now. Speaking staying on the kind of the, the cornerback situation here, I thought Mikey Sanders still was outstanding. He's getting better and better. He he was yes. outstanding in that game. He had a big pass breakup on a third down against Deontay Johnson and just the nuance and the 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 skill set of him knowing they tried to run a rub route with him. He avoided the rub route and was right in the hip pocket, blanket coverage, makes the uh the pass break up without uh, having a pass interference penalty. There were some times in run support or bubble screens where he slips blocks, makes tackles, or forces the the runner back to the pursuit angles. These are things that you see, and this is a rookie doing this types of things. Where you're just like, man, he's really, really turning it on. The last few ball games, he's he's uh he's on the upticks on the climb. Yeah. All right, let's talk about the offense for a minute. So Brian Robinson comes back. Carolina is decimated up front. They are missing six starters. A lot of players. Yes. They're giving up a ton of yards on the ground. If you watch them in their last couple of games against Chicago and Atlanta, they're getting just pushed off the line. This is a very good run offense here. So here's another really good sign that this is a very serious operation, that there is no other shoe to drop at this point. They took advantage of a team that had injuries and deficiencies. That's what good teams do. Hey. You know we're going to do it to you. You can't stop it. It's your problem and your issue that you have to deal with your injuries. We don't care. It's the NFL, and they rushed for almost 200 yards again. Man, that's nothing more demoralizing from a defense than – a team just running the football like you know they're going to run it. They know you know they're going to run it, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. B-Rob, what I love about B-Rob is we talked about how much we missed him last week in the, yep. in the Baltimore game. And, yeah, the Ravens, they're number one ranked rush defense in the league. The thing about B-Rob is with some of the, because of his size and his forward body lane, where one of the other backs – May have gotten two, maybe three yards. B. Rob's going to get four or five, even possibly six right. yards because of that body lane. And now you're operating in second and fives, third and twos, third and ones, third and threes. A lot more manageable down and this is where the playbook is kind of opened up a little bit more. So just having him back on the field, and you saw what what he's able to do having those uh. That rushing, uh, what they had two rushing touchdowns or uh, one, one rushing touchdown. Just um, B. Rob physicality, and this this run game that travels week in and week out. You're going to be able to run the ball. All the misdirection stuff that they're doing. Jaden Daniels, his first run. All the misdirection. You're pulling guards. You're pulling tackles. It forces you as a linebacker. You don't know where the ball is at, and does the quarterback have it? Does the running back have it? Who has the football? So you're going to be a half a second slow, and by that time, you're getting a lineman hitting you in the face or a quarterback running back past you or B-Rob 
you know, doing his thing or Austin Eckler or Jeremy McNichol. So, it's, I mean, that running game is awesome. I've described it as he's gas in the tank yes. for them. That like, because just the way he plays, he's a favorite of mine. Because just the way he plays for a couple of years now, just his physicality reminds me of the old school Redskins. The Hogs, Rigo, Gerald Riggs, George Rogers, Ernest Biner, Stephen Davis. These very tough mm-hmm. running backs that nobody wanted any part of in the fourth quarter. He reminds me of that. And last week, after he missed the game, Cliff Kingsbury described it as he what he brings to us emotionally, yeah. let alone his play on the field. People just feed off a – they see what he's doing. Dan Quinn reiterated it too. He said, this is what we want to be, him. Yes. We want everybody to be him. Like emotionally, this is how we want to play. Every run. He was talking to us in the post game, and he's like, I know what I can do, and I know what I bring. And he's right. It's not ego or cockiness. He recognizes that when he's going, this whole team is going. Just going back to when I first saw B Rob run back in the preseason years ago, a couple years ago. I said he, he reminded me of two two Hall of Fame running backs. He has feet like Frank Gore hmm. as a linebacker. I'm, I go into a game plan. I'm studying a running back. I'm studying the guys I go. I'm going against. Frank Gore had these great feet. He was able to get in and out of cut, jump cuts. I mean, get pick his feet up, put them back down so quickly. He has he has the feet of a, a guy like a Frank Gore, and he has the body lean of an Edrin James where you don't see him getting knocked backwards because he has that forward body lane. And this is a guy six foot two running with that type of forward lane. So it's a hard, it's a hard um, target to hit. With his ability, his feet, and that body lane, he's going to be extremely productive. And he has the ability for a bigger back to get what we call skinny through a little small hole and crease and things like that. So, I mean, the guy – He's. I love him. I love the way he yeah. plays the game. Um, so you told me yesterday you were nervous going into this game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, for one of the first <laughs> times, it's my job to be nervous and be ready for anything. I was not. I know, It man. was based mainly on the injuries that Carolina has, where I looked at them and I go, they can't stop us. Like, not, not with the personnel that they're putting out there. Short of weird fumbles or some kind of, like, weird bounces of the ball – I knew we were scoring 30. It was just a question of how much were we giving up. Now, nervous, I didn't think we were going to lose. I just thought it might be a, a, a shootout because our defense hadn't been stopping a run yeah. you know, up until that point. And, and coming off the game against the Baltimore Ravens where you know you don't, you don't stop the run the way you need to stop it. And then we're down, Jonathan Allen, you know, Doris Armstrong. And so I'm like, man, this could be a shootout. And, I, and Andy Dalton had been playing some decent ball for the Panthers. So – I was a little nervous. I, I admit it, but you I were did waiting not. For the other I shit. did not think the Carolina Panthers were going to beat us. Nah, I just we're did. in a new day. I'm trying to tell you, <laughs> the other shoe isn't dropping here, London. We're in a new day. We're a weakened opponent walks into our house off of a loss. We're going to take care of business. But did you see? Right. We we have to admit we didn't see forty to seven. No, especially after Jaden got hurt. I mean, at that point, I'm going okay. Let's just manage the game here, right. which was maybe the biggest surprise of all of it. Nothing was tailored back for Marcus Mariotti when he came out there. I thought Dan Quinn was interesting when we spoke to him after the game where he said, there's a completely different call sheet that is ready mm-hmm. for Mariota. But you know, at face value, it looked like Cliff wasn't held back at all once he came into the game. Right, yeah. No, he said uh, they got two game plans. You know, the the Mariota plays that, that he they really like calling for him. Mariota, he start. He came into the game a little, little rusty, and he mentioned that. Yeah. You know, it took him a little bit to get his feet under him, and the defense was continuing to do what they did. But once, I thought once he started making plays off schedule, started to scramble a little bit, started to run around, and that muscle memory, that that playmaker mentality came back. The touchdown pass that he threw to Zach Ertz. Oh, my goodness. That was a dart. That was a dart. Dart on the move. On the move. Yes. That drive in general, I think, told me everything. So they get the ball back with two-something on the clock, right? 
It's a great punt. They're pinned at the eight yard line. They run a run play and let it get to. The, there's no no rush. They oh, let it get to the two minute warning. Yeah. Carolina oddly doesn't use a timeout. Okay, they're down twenty to nothing. They're not using and a they timeout. Three timeouts. Three timeouts. They're and not using a timeout. Warning. Washington then runs another play, a short what run play or short pass play. I don't even remember, but it was a, not down the field. It's yeah. third and whatever. Carolina doesn't use a timeout. Clock's running. It was like almost like they thought there was some gentleman's agreement right. that Washington was just going to run, you know, maybe get a first down and just run the clock out and take a twenty nothing lead into the break. And at that point, I think Kingsbury goes, "If you're not going to try to stop us, or you think we're just going to sit on the ball, you're wrong." And they opened it up. And <laughs> that was amazing. And I'll tell you what: if I'm the Carolina people, I am asking the coach. Why were you not calling timeouts to try to get the ball back at the end of the half? Because the end result looks awful for them. Oh, yeah, it, it did. And that was you, Mariota, that's when he really started to get, yeah. get his confidence going. He, he had a like a five or six yard completion to Ertz. Might have been second and 10 or, yeah. or third and five or something like that. I can't remember. And then there was a, a comeback to Terry. Hmm. And that was one of the first balls I saw that it felt like he threw on time where, all right, trust it, let it rip, starts, starts to get the feeling. I think he hit another one to Noah Brown. So he, he got into a rhythm, and they, they went into their up-tempo mode, and next thing you know, we're, we're getting another touchdown. Yeah, I, like this was just another sign of, like last week they posted some stat during the Ravens game where they're like, Washington's gone no huddle and up-tempo more than double any other team in the NFL. It's obviously working for them. They came in with the number two ranked offense. I'll have to look if they're number one now after scoring 40 yesterday. They didn't stop doing it when he went out there. Right. They're up 27 to nothing. They didn't stop doing it while he was out there. They just ran their stuff. And, and you would think... At some point, okay, we're up 27 nothing. Maybe we'll take a little bit more time to, to snap the ball. This is their identity. They, they, they didn't take their foot off the gas, which we've seen countless games where teams get up big in the first half. And they just, I thought when they came out at halftime, they were going to run the ball. That they, was it. That's take, what I thought. Yep, yeah, yeah, take their foot off the gas. Team, the other team gets a little momentum, and next thing you know, you're in a dogfight in the fourth quarter when, it, when you should have blown that team out. But – they did not take their foot off the gas, and they continued to execute their offense, and they ran it to, ran it to perfection. Now, I, I'm not advocating they should have done this or should have been thinking about this, but there was one opportunity, karmically, uh -huh. for this team at the end of the half that I would love to have seen them do. Not that anyone would have been thinking about this, but when they scored with 10 seconds left, it was 26 to nothing. Had right. they gone for two and made it 28 to nothing, going into halftime, retiring the number 28 in Washington history, that would have been amazing. Yeah. That would have been amazing. It, it, it would have been amazing. However, if you you go for two, you're up 26. Does that feel like a little bit of a bit much? Yes, of course. Yeah, so. Well, just like you, they had a fourth and one in the red zone and they kicked a field goal. And I said to you on the air, I go, they go for all of these. They don't want to run up the score. Right. But they're kicking a field goal here because they're being cognizant that they're trying not to run up the score. But when they had that fourth and one, I'm like, they – always go for these. They are hyper-aggressive. They went for a fourth and four against the Ravens early in the game. You knew if this was a tighter game, they would have gone for that, but they chose to back off. No, that would that would have, like you said, to have it 28 nothing at halftime that would have been on, amazing. on the day Daryl Green's jersey is being retired, that, that would have been amazing. Yes. All right, so let's talk about Jaden now for a little bit. So first drive, gets injured somewhere, we're not sure. All the you know video sleuths are trying to figure out, did it happen on the first run? Yeah. Did it happen later? Whatever. He injured his ribs. All we know is he injured his ribs. We don't know to the extent, and we're going to find out with you later today. All right. Um, Mariota comes in. Everything works great, fine. That's very reassuring to see that. I think long-term, we all understand number five needs to be out there for them. No offense to Mariota. All right. So... As you kind of think about this moving forward, without knowing to what extent the injury is, how are you kind of thinking about him in the short-term future? Well, just like you said, not knowing the extent of the injury, he's whether it's he's going to be extremely sore this week. So how much he's able to practice, you don't know. The good thing is Mariota will be able to take the majority, if not all, of the first-team reps. So you'll be able to have him get more of a timing with his receivers in a game 
in, in a game situation, he'll get that that rhythm and timing with the uh, with the uh, Deami Brown. Like he missed him early on the, on the. I felt like they just weren't in sync because they they probably hadn't practiced together. Yeah. So that'll be that'll be the benefit of you know if Jaden has to miss a little bit of the practice time, but you never know how how things will kind of take shape. I know this is a game has been flexed into the 425 window and this the number one overall draft pick against the number two overall draft pick. Let's not lose sight, though. This is the eighth game of the season also. So if there's a situation where – and I know they're not going to put him out on that field if they feel like that he would be putting himself in harm. They didn't do it with further, B-Rob a week ago. Yeah, further they down, held so. him out for the purpose of getting him through the rest of the season. They wanted him to play, and from what I could tell – he might have been able to, yeah. but they felt it was in his best interest and the team's best interest. So I agree with you, with Jay. So, so, yeah, we want to see number one versus number two pick, but again, I know they're going to do the best for Jaden. Thinking long term, thinking big picture wise. So, you know, I'm, I'm anxious to see what'll happen, and and I feel like if Jaden can't go, Mariota will be more than capable to lead us to a victory if he can. And that would probably be on an assumption that the ribs aren't broken, right? right. That's that's a bad scenario if that's the case. I'll probably miss some time if that's the case. We'll find out. But let's say it's a pain maintenance thing, and they do determine he can go and he wants to go. Does that change how Cliff is going to think about calling the game? Because I would assume you don't want to expose him either way to hits. Yeah, no, you definitely don't. I've, I've dealt with some, some cartilage uh, issues before. In my, in my ribs, and I practice with them. It's it's, it's painful. And then in the game, I got a what you call a pain killing injection. I was able to do everything I needed to do in that game, and like you feel great. Now after the game, <laughs> that was, was Monday. Oh yeah, you're you're back in pain, but you definitely want to limit the amount of of hits he's taking if you if possible. So, but the zone read and the run that's part of our. Our identity. Yeah. Now you're not going to have the design, the truly designed quarterback runs, and even Jaden, he'll probably, if it's a zone read, he's probably going to hand it off. You may see more RPO stuff where it's either run or bubble, or run or or quick slant. If if that's the case, so you know, assuming he's it's just a pain tolerance thing, they got they got something for that, and he can. He can be able to play in that ball game, definitely. Well, Mariota, I want to go back to something we were talking about earlier with kind of like the purposeful signings that occurred here that are all kind of working out so far to have the season that they've had. I think Mariota's one of them. Like, Mariota walked this walk, number two overall pick, Heisman Trophy winner, has seen it all in uh-huh. his career, right? Um, Kingsbury had said back in camp when we asked about him, he said – he loved him in college. He was intrigued by him, what he was able to do. The he, this is the type of player he always wanted to work with, now has the opportunity to do this. Mariota's been nothing but supportive of Daniels throughout this entire process. Daniels has said when asked about him that he's been really good with helping him kind of navigate all the different things that are going on. And then there he was going out there and looking like the number two overall yeah. pick, Heisman Trophy winner, and it's been some time for him. I, I would imagine today – he feels pretty good because that's what he was capable of early in his career. And here it was. It's been a long road to see one of those for him. Cause we mentioned, I think it was the first time he threw for over 200 yards in like four years, two, four years, something like that. Like it had been a while for him. Mm-hmm. I, I think about remember the, the, when he was with the Falcons a couple years ago and they came in here, he was hurting us. I mean, he was killing running. us running the, running the football. Yeah. He seemed to, be at on top of his game, this passing game that he's playing in and with these receivers, he looked on point, man. Just you can see the confidence going and developing as he as a, as the game went on. Like again, some of those timing route plays, he was just letting it rip and trusting, hey, trusting the receiver to come back and be be at the spot they're supposed to be at. And and again, once he's able to ad lib, make plays, um, create. I love the fact that. Because he's so seasoned, he gets out of the pocket, he's scrambling, but he's keeping his eyes down the field for open receivers. From a defensive standpoint, that puts a lot of pressure on you as a, as a secondary contain type of guy. You're like, you're kind of in a bind. Do I come up to try to stop him from gaining yards scrambling, or do I stay back in coverage? And that, that, that hesitancy, hesitancy by a, um, 
a defender allows more plays to to develop and, and big plays to develop. He was feeling it too. I mean, the the drive we talked about at the end with the throw to Ertz, he had a throw in between defenders to McLaurin that was outstanding, a yeah. dart that yeah. he threw. So his confidence was back up. And I think we was talking to him afterwards too. He's just like, he admitted, he goes, there's just something going on here. We're all so connected that everybody seems to step up. And it was nice to see him do that because he knew what his role, even when he signed here, they had the number two overall mm-hmm. pick. He knew what they were going to do. Like, it wasn't like it's some big surprise to him, but he came here. Brian Johnson's a big deal with this, came here from Philadelphia with him, had a relationship with him. This staff is part of this story here too, how deep specifically on offense that it is, with the people who are coaching these players. It, it's he's just another piece of there's something really special going on here that him in all the different roads that he's traveled to get to this point could show up. And when it was 10, nothing, you could not have convinced me they were scoring 30 more points at that no. point when Jane went out and there it was anyway. Yeah, no, I was uh, I thought it was OK. Maybe this might be a defense not allowed him to, to yes. score any, any more points. Um, You know, 40 didn't see it be a 40 points. But again, I was just. And Mayor Oda talked about, and we asked him, the preparation that it takes to to be a backup quarterback is still try to prepare as a starting. He mentioned how after practice, he's out there with the practice squad guys going through the script, so he's getting his reps in. And, and you know, that takes a lot of commitment, a, a dedication. It's time-consuming because this is after the practice is over. So yeah. you're going out and you're – going through that script and running the plays and doing all that type of stuff. So, you know, shout out to him. Shout out to the practice squad guys for, you know, getting getting him ready to play. We have some interesting, like, you know, quarterback things that have occurred this year throughout the league. Like, Sam Darnold's having a great year. He might not have projected to be the starter in the first place until J.J. McCarthy got hurt. Andy Dalton we saw yesterday. Obviously, the record is what it is. Yeah. And the Bryce Young situation is a whole different situation. Russell Wilson played last night, made his first start with Pittsburgh. He and Justin Fields, I think they're going to decide as we go along here who's best served for them to be the starting quarterback for them. But he was very good in what was his debut with Pittsburgh. So maybe there is, you know, if this is a short term, we got to be without Jaden for a week or two. Hopefully it's nothing more than that, if that at all. We might be all right here. Yeah. No, again, what Mariota did, he's proved he proved to us and and everybody else in the NFL that and, and this is not just a one-man team. Jaden is a, a tremendous part of what we're doing. I mean, he's played phenomenal. <laughs> he, has, yes. he has played lights out. But the way they've built this team to where there's so many pieces, you know, it's a weld oil machine, so to speak. Um, and we, got, we got a lot of parts to this, to, this, um, to this machine, and we got guys that can that get the job done. Maybe you lean on a running game a lot more. Maybe it's a game where, you know, heck, we rush for 250 or 300 yards. Each game is going to play itself out a little bit differently. But I'm, I'm and, or maybe, hey, the, game, the defense has to step up and do what they did, the special teams, all those things. We're capable of winning multi, in multiple different ways. You brought up the parts. Jason's very happy with you because his <laughs> bit this week is we are a well oiled machine and he wants to put names to the parts okay. of, the, of the machine. All right. <laughs> so we got the radiator. Who do you think the radiator <laughs> is of the commanders this year? A radiator, man. Let me see. What, what else? A radiator. Well, I'll give you, I'll, I'll tell you who tell I think the, the radiator is. I think that's actually the coaching staff. All DQ, right. okay. Joe Witt Jr. Cliff Kingsbury, all the assistant coaches, I think they're they're the like they're keeping the airflow perfect throughout the season. Right. They're the radiator. I'll, I'll let you have the yeah. radiator. I'm gonna go with the Pistons. I think the Pistons are the offensive line. Oh, all right, all, offensive line. The Pistons, they're they're fine, you know. So I'm going with the offensive line. Yeah. I had B Rob as the Pistons, I but got I like the offensive line. I got, line. I got I agree I'm with you. I'm surprised you, you use him as because. B Rob, all right, spark plugs. So I put spark plugs. I put Eckler, McCaffrey, McNichols, spark plugs of of like people that maybe Eckler doesn't fall in this category, but like McCaffrey, McNichols. Every week there's like a moment with one of them where you're like, oh, I get it now. These are kind of the parts. Sinnott had a moment yesterday. Spark plugs. You know yeah. what? I'm, I've got to go back because I, I, I'm changing pistons. The Pistons is the are the receivers. I'm going right. to go with the wide receivers for that. Spark plugs. I, I really like your 
your running backs and, and uh, Eckler. I throw, I even throw Savage still in there as a yeah. spark plug. Yes. And Frankie Louvo. I have Louvo as the motor. I uh, <laughs> Louvo as the motor. <laughs> wait, wait, That's wait, the energy. Wait, listen, the diesel fuel, B-Rob. Okay. B and Rob, the you said line. It. I mean, if we're going to do the diesel thing, then we might as well talk about the running back and the offensive line. If we're going to go back in history and talk about it, the diesel and the hogs were the diesel fuel of the whole thing. I'm going B-Rob, d line. I throw uh, Bobby Wagner in there. Yes, I had him yeah, as diesel yeah, fuel. Yes. Diesel fuel. The motor. The motor's the d- offensive line. Okay. The motor is the offensive line. What's there, Luvu then? I already had him in there as a... Uh, Let's see, spark plug? He's a spark plug. He's diesel right. fuel. He pissed. He's a radiator. Yeah. I don't know. He's, he like, he's a little he, bit of, he seems he's to, a hybrid. He's a motor to me because he seems to epitomize the way he that these guys want the whole team to play. And he's kind of all of that. He's like all of that energy. So he's the motor to me. I, the offensive line is the motor. I agree. The they had to go the, somewhere. The, yeah, they, I like diesel fuel. B Rob offensive line because that's like kind of an homage to the past, right. which means the Pistons have to be. I've lost this. I've lost the story. <laughs> we, we, I don't know. You had to. You had to. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I've lost the thread now. No, Confused. we're good. We're good. We got yeah. it. We got it. You're all great, guys. Yeah. You're all great, guys. <laughs> all right, time for Big Fletch's heavyweight commander championship ding, 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 belt. Ding, ding, ding. We get this off of wins. I think what well, last week. Well, the voice from God will tell you it was Luvu. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So, Frankie Luvo, he's the heavyweight champion right now. He has Big Fletch's heavyweight belt. The challenger, the guy who's up for challenging Frankie Luvo after yesterday's performance, I got to go with Dante Fowler. Give you the sack, the stats. Two tackles, one sack, a pick, touchdown. All right, two tackles. Two, two, we say two tackles. A sack. A sack. One, one pick, one touchdown. Frankie's uh, Louisville stats in the yesterday's game. Two tackles, two assists, one sack. <sighs> this is a tough one. How are you not picking Fowler? I, I, they're, they're <laughs> comp- this is a competition. Got it. It's Fowler against Louisville for who's the who's who going to walk away with the belt. This is solely based off yesterday's performance against the Carolina Panthers. Ding, 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 ding. And new... Heavyweight champion, Dante Fowler. <laughs> Do you know that was his first ever interception? It, Ten yeah. year his first ever interception. And and he ran and when he got, but I was impressed with the moves that he made. Yeah. Once he got he bah, 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 hurling guys. He looked like a running back. Rewatch it though. He was running out of gas when he got to <laughs> the 20 yard line. Because the whole time I'm like, he's gonna get there, I think. <laughs> Hey, man, you haven't yeah. ran 70 yards with somebody chasing you? No, <laughs> and I never will either. Uh, all right, one more thing. I've, congratulations, Dante Fowler, by the yeah. way. Deserving of it, deserving of it. All right, one more thing before we get to a little preview, because we have a good game coming up this weekend. We got flexed into the 425 yeah. spot national game. I want to ask you about a comparison um, for this team and something that you played on, just to see if it kind of meshes with you. Because 5-2 and two is unexpected. This team has really come together for all the reasons we've talked about. That was an extremely impressive win. I know Car- people are going to poo-poo it because it was Carolina, but like you beat anybody 40-7. to seven, And, oh, by the way, your quarterback got hurt on his first offensive drive. You did something really right. And yeah. it's just the epitome of kind of where this thing is going. Um, you played on the greatest show on turf Rams, right? And the thing that people forget about when it turned for them was it did happen kind of overnight. Yes. Like, that was a 4-12 and 12 team. And then the next year, Trent Green gets hurt, and Kurt Warner comes in. Kurt Warner's not the number two overall pick who won a Heisman Trophy. And you guys had one of the greatest offenses of all time, and that went on a good, what, three- to five-year run where it was the greatest show on turf, and a number of these people are Hall of Famers now. Torrey Holt, Isaac Bruce, you know, Marshall Falk. Kurt Warner, and then hopefully you in the very near future. Orlando Pace as well. Yeah, Orlando Pace, hopefully you in the very near future. Does this, can you compare this at all to like, because it, that, that's the one part of this that seems to compare to me. I don't think anybody saw that coming when it happened. And I think now in 2024, nobody saw this coming together so fast with this team. Yeah, it's, I don't want, it's hard for me to compare it to that because that, now, the offense, both are explosive. Yes. There was, that offense was, you know, more of an aerial attack and 
I mean, it was it was two plays in, in the end zone, so it was just Warner's accuracy. Yeah, was Yeah, his accuracy, yes. his story. It was a storybook, you know, Disney World type movie because of his story and all that other stuff. Defensively, we were we were top five defense as well. That's a, that's the thing that people don't talk about a lot. But I will say this: the the quick turnaround, and also the kind of tempered, you know, people just kind of waiting to see is this real. Those are comparisons where, like, is this real? Are the Rams, are we a, a legitimate contender? And as the season continued to progress and go, and we just kept winning and blowing people out, it's just like, no, we're, we're legit. And I think that's what, that's, that will definitely be a similarity where people re- will find out and realize, no, this, is, this team is legit, and they're here to stay, and they're not going anywhere. So, like, obviously Dick Vermeil is not Dan Quinn, but I, I think similarly – very personal relationships with his players. They want to play for him. I know you had the experience, and you, you've been close with him for years. Yeah, I would say that the camaraderie, the the chemistry, just we we hung out a lot off the field. Love being around each other. I see that in the, from a similarity standpoint. These guys seem like they enjoy being around each other and. A, a true family type atmosphere, and it was the head coach who set that culture. You know, it is interesting though. Like back in the summer. It's not that anyone. Well, no one was asking Washington, "Are you going to have a breakout year?" Because I don't think anyone just perceived it to happen for so many reasons. Rookie quarterback, it's not typical for it to happen. Thirty new players, new coaching staff. It's just baked in that it's going to be whatever it is. The Eagles and Dallas both have very good teams, so nobody's projecting them to even win the division. Right. But in the summer, you could feel the confidence. But until they start playing, it goes back to we're waiting for the other shoe to drop. History here of not winning very much with the Rams. I think that's where. That's where I kind of see the similarity, too. But you lived it where there couldn't have been anybody in the summer that was like, you know what? Uh, <laughs> you know, guess what? They're going to be the best team uh, in the NFL. There's nobody that could have possibly been saying the Rab, that. The Rams and the Bengals were the losingest teams in the 90s. As you mentioned, the year was 98, 98 season. We went 4-12. and 12. So there was – Dick Vermeil, he was, he was coaching for his job. Yeah. There was, the, there was no – if there's a but, no secret, no mystery to that. He was coaching for his job. He was, I think they won maybe five games his first year in 97 yeah. for his second season in 98. So, I mean, this was it. This was it for him. Did you know, though, in the summer or early in the season, like did, did you have to see it to believe it or did you know early people are underrating us? Underrated is not even the right word for it because you guys ended up being the best team in the NFL by far, specifically offensively. I don't, I, we knew that offense was <laughs> going against that offense every day in practice. We knew they were going to be a problem. They had so much speed. And then we traded for Marshall Falk. So yeah. the speed, Marshall Falk drafted Torrey Holt. Isaac Bruce, who hadn't been healthy, was finally healthy. I mean, we knew the offense was going to put up points. Now, defensively, were we going to be able to – and we were a solid defense the, the prior year. Was it going to be – were we going to be able to put it all together? Yeah. Well, that's interesting because that's what's happening here. Yes. Because I don't know I don't know how they would qualify it, the coaches, but, you know, on certain areas like the run game defense, they've given up a ton of passing touchdowns this year. They hadn't been getting a lot of turnovers. They want to see that turn the corner – and what we're finding here is, is this offense is a well-oiled machine to the point where the backup could come in. And I know that's not your normal backup. That's a longtime veteran who's a Heisman Trophy winner, who's been a starter for a long time. But still, he's the backup. And you still, like nothing changed. You're walking up and down the field. It does feel very well-oiled to the point where if the defense can get marginally better from where it is, there might be special things in store uh, and, here. And I will say this, too. Special teams was a huge part of our success. We had great coverage units, but our returns, our return games, we we had I don't know, a couple kickoff returns for touchdowns, a couple punt returns for touchdowns. So we want to see – we've been – our coverage units have been outstanding. I feel like we're on the cusp of breaking some of these returns, whether it's in the punt game or the, or the kickoff return game. You know, that's – those are going to be elements that, you know, if that those things start to pop up too – Watch out. We don't have a nickname yet for this team. They got greatest show on <laughs> turf. Let's see what happens. We need a little more time for a nickname. Yeah, we'll yeah. Let's, let's just take it one game at a time yeah. before we start throwing out nicknames. Listen, man, I'm in it. I'm wrapped up in it. And you know what? I, I, I believe what I see. 
So you know what? I'll take your submissions and uh, recommendations for nicknames for this. I'm not going to say I'm going to pick it, but I'll, uh, <laughs> but I'll take the recommendations because it's hard to not look at this and go, that's real. And yeah. we have a special season in front of us. And they got some decisions to make as the trade deadline approaches because, you know, I, I would argue this team should bolster its roster and give these guys a shot to win. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm sure they're, they're doing that due diligence on – people that are out there and they know they're available. But you also got to figure, would that person be the right fit for your locker room? Those are things that you got to weigh heavily. Yeah, he might be a great talent, but is he the right person to bring into what we're doing here? They got a good locker room going here. I think that's a big part of this. All right, this is a good one this weekend. CBS flexed it. They want the number one versus number two quarterback. We'll find out later on. Um, this week, if we're going to get that, Chicago started a little slow, especially on offense. Mm-hmm. Caleb had a couple of rough games. They've been surging. Their defense is very good. Their offense has a ton of weapons. This is a heck of a test. This it, 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 it is a heck of a test, and you know, I wish uh, Chicago hadn't got it going so so quickly, so soon. And, and then they're coming off a bye week as well, so they'll have a little bit more time to yeah. to kind of prepare. But again, I expect us to stick to our, our guns and, and in terms of our game plan, do what we do extremely well. There'll be favorable matchups for us, and I'm sure the, the Bears will feel like they have some matchups that they like. I think the pass rush will be key in this game against the Chicago Bears because you don't want Caleb to be back there sitting around, and I think that's where he's really at his best when he's able to go off script and, and be in that pocket and, and you know start to run around and do different things. So I've I've seen both on that with him. There are some ghastly errors. Yes. And there are some Mahomesy-like plays. And I think we can all agree. And I'm rooting for him. He's local. He played at Gonzaga. I'm rooting for him. You know, and I hope he has a great career. I hope it's the first of many between these two quarterbacks. Maybe not so much Sunday, but I'm rooting for him. He's going to be good. He's going to be good. He, he's When he gets the feel for it, he's going to get real good. I think he's still in the middle of, he's going to play his way, very instinctual, but at this level, it's going to cost him sometimes. It, it is sometimes, and I think, you know, him developing and getting an understanding NFL defenses, like the speed of NFL defenses, the disguises, things like that. But the Bears, uh, looking at their defense – I don't, and I don't know the stats and where they are as far in terms of stopping a run. I know they, they've made a lot of plays down the stretch last season, yeah. but are they going to be apt to be able to stop our run game? We don't know who's going to be the quarterback. So, you know, those type of things going to change. Are they? I know they got a heck of a corner in uh, Jalen Johnson. Yes. So it, it, it'll, it'll be a fun matchup, Our old man. buddy Montez will fun. be back in town. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Tez, Tez will be motivated. It'll be, yeah. it'll be a fun matchup. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. They, Quinn called last week the first heavyweight fight that they had. I don't know if this is heavyweight yet, but it's close. And it's, it's, it's close. And it's an and, NFC, it's NFC guy. And that's a 4-2 and two team. Mm-hmm. They're a contender, too. Yeah. And go look at their weapons that they have. They're feeling very positive that they might have a special season ahead of them, too. I, I really – man – they got they got weapons, but I, I was so impressed with the defensive game plan that Joe Wood put Joe Wood Jr. and his coaching staff put together against the Carolina Panthers. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing like how are they gonna what kind of plan they're gonna have for DJ Moore, yeah. um, Keenan Allen over there now. So Roma Dunze, Roma Dunze you know it's those as good uh, a trio the, of receivers. And, uh, I think tight end was a Cole Cole Komet. Yes, um, so yeah. just just. That's the great thing about this sport. Every week you have a new challenge. And if you can't get up for this game, man, which I know we will be up for the game, this this is gonna be it's Saturday, Sunday at four twenty five. It's gonna be special. I think it's gonna be the first of many between these two teams over the next however many years with these two quarterbacks and where things are kind of going. It feels like the roads over the next few years may be going through one of these two spots. I just hope they're going through. Northwest Stadium is still over Chicago. It's, 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 a, a playoff game in Chicago. <laughs> It'll go a long way to making that happen if they win on Sunday, at least no, for Yeah, this I, would, I would rather yeah. have those playoff games at, at, at Northwest Stadium. Well, go ask Daryl Green about that. He had a good answer about that in yeah, the 1980s. Yeah. Yeah. Like, we'll be up in the booth. but yeah. it's, <laughs> Windows closed for once, maybe. Yeah. Minus yeah. four, whatever it is. 
All right, Big Fletch, five and two. It's feeling pretty good. I can't wait for this weekend. Oh, man, I'm looking forward to it. Feeling great. All right, that'll do it for the booth review. We'll see you next week.